Okay, so uh, let me try to yeah, uh, quickly cover this uh, uh, visualizing and understanding part. So yeah, this uh, occlusion experiment is uh, quite simple, but it's quite uh, effective method. Okay, so so when uh, given a full image like this, and then uh, suppose uh, it was classified as ninety five percent of the um, elephant, and then uh, if we just uh, randomly hide or remove some speci yeah, specific regional patches and then uh, we see how much this uh, uh, probability has dropped so when hiding this part uh, it was dropped into 93 and then uh, it's like having 2% of the um, uh, importance and then uh, if we just uh, uh, remove this patch next time and then uh, it dropped around 89 and then it means that uh, it has the importance of 60 percent right which show yeah which indicates that the, the accuracy drop right and so this uh, occlusion experiment is uh, also, uh, quite widely used in uh, not just in this uh, machine learning but also uh, this uh, deep learning tasks but also in general machine learning so <clears throat> how do you measure the the importance of a particular variable so yeah so given like height and the weight and maybe blood type and then I uh, suppose you uh, trained your classifier for um, yeah for the um, diabetes of a particular yep, of a particular person having a particular feature vector and then suppose the classification accuracy of uh, whether uh, a, per a given person uh, having a diabetes or not uh, is like 89 percent okay so this is overall uh, accuracy value of course uh, it can yeah it should be for uh, validation or the test set accuracy and then uh, yeah, it, yeah and on also you can use a logistic regression or the uh, gradient boosting tree or random forest and maybe knn classifier and so on right so we can have a freedom to choose any particular classifier that we can have and then <clears throat> uh, given the setting as yeah suppose you just removed one variable at a time and then just uh, do the um, yeah from the training part i mean from the training phase we uh, train our model all over again by only using the two features and then suppose the accuracy has been dropped by uh, 89 percent and then it means that this guy has the variable importance of the um, 6%. Okay? And in this case, suppose we remove this uh, blood type. And then uh, compared to this accuracy, uh, so, uh, this accuracy yeah, didn't, yeah, didn't drop almost at all. So in this case, it uh, has only like a 1% of variable importance. Okay? So that way, <coughs> we can yeah, uh, we can measure this uh, variable importance, importance not just uh, in this uh, deep learning tasks, but also in many other machine learning or general machine learning tasks. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, as uh, the color gets darker, and it means the accuracy has dropped much or much more. Okay. And this uh, saliency map, so the main idea is to just to pick up uh, one single uh, yeah, one, one single node at a particular layer, whether it is at the last layer uh, corresponding to yeah, corresponding to a particular class of dog, uh, for example, but also we can do yeah, we can choose any internal node or maybe the third node in this uh, fully connected layer okay <clears throat> so yeah once picking up that starting point and then uh, we just uh, simply set the gradient of this chosen node as positive one okay and then do the back propagation okay and then from here we don't change 
although we have to uh, do the unback propagation but we don't actually do the parameter updating on this part but uh, we just back propagate basically to propagate this information about this gradient all the way to the um, input uh, images uh, pixel level okay and then <clears throat> Yeah. Once we find, yeah, finally arrive this uh, uh, input layer, and then uh, at every pixel, we will have a particular gradient value, and uh, it could be uh, plus three and uh, negative two, and maybe plus five and so on, right? So it means, yeah, it's representing. Yeah, basically, you can intuitively think of it as kind of a sensitivity. So when selecting this pixel by the amount of plus one for example and then uh, the gradient at this point uh, will be dropped by maybe negative two and uh, plus three and plus five and so on so you can view it as kind of a sensitivity like how sensitive this node with respect to each of our input node and so <clears throat> if it is a if a particular pixel is more kind of a, uh, I mean uh, it causes more kind of sensitivity to the um, alpha node that we chose here and then it means that uh, this pixel has more influence to this uh, uh, the target node okay so that's how we kind of measure uh, the importance with respect to each of these pixels for this uh, chosen or given uh, given final node okay so again we can start uh, from the output node corresponding to a particular class label but also we can just uh, select yeah any any given yeah any part yeah any uh, internal node in the um, uh, hidden layers okay so <clears throat> in this case let's see so suppose uh, this guy has a negative 5 as a pixel wise gradient so in this case yeah in uh, in this case the meaning of it is this pex, uh, this pixel value should decrease right so when it decreases and then our uh, our target node will increase okay because we set the gradient of it as positive one okay okay and then this guy and then uh, yeah mm, yeah it should increase uh, so that the target node uh, should uh, so the target node can increase okay so the sign is also important right so you can think of it as follows so uh, let's start from here and then uh, having a, a plus one as a starting gradient and then suppose this pixel has a negative five uh, for its gradient and what does that mean okay uh, in order to make uh, this image look more like dog, I mean, more like the dog than the current status, and then this pixel value should get darker, right? So that's the meaning, okay? But sometimes this pixel uh, has the gradient of plus four, and then it should be brighter. Okay, but uh, yeah, when uh, viewing or yeah, when forming this kind of figure uh, by using this uh, salience in my method, then uh, you can just uh, utilize yeah, you can just use this uh, absolute value, okay, uh, purely the magnitude of this uh, sensitivity or the um, the amount of the um, influence to the um, target node. Okay, so uh, utilizing yeah, using this uh, we can do the um, unsupervised <coughs> segmentation like this. So it's just like a kind of instant segmentation that we saw by using the mask RCNM, for example. Uh, suppose we just obtained this uh, detection kind of region uh, for this bird, and then uh, the next step in uh, uh, happening in the um, uh, mask RCNM is to come up with the um, uh, pixel-wise segmentation that indicates this uh, foreground objects of our interest. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, when doing this uh, backpropagation, starting from any given 
any given uh, hidden hidden node or the final node, uh, we can actually uh, yeah impose some some of the heuristics. So yeah, although it was not explained in in more de yeah in full detail, but uh, let me give the brief idea about how it works. So. <coughs> Suppose this was our uh, forward pass. So this is a uh, one particular channel of activation map in a, in a conv layer, and then uh, when passing it through the uh, value, and then uh, those those value will get killed uh, into zero, right? And then suppose uh, we do the um, back propagation, and then arriving at this output activation channel, and then uh, suppose this is our gradient value, right? And then uh, uh, when passing back through this uh, ReLU layer, and then we just have to remember or utilize uh, where this uh, activation map uh, was originally negative value so that uh, the output becomes zero after uh, as a result of the ReLU. So ReLU has this guy, right? So if it originally has this uh, negative value and then uh, you guys know that the, the slope will get zero, right? So the gradients should be multiplied with uh, zero. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so these were the negative values, and then uh, those gradients will get killed, right, when backpropagating through this layer, right. But this guided backprop uh, actually adds one additional kind of heuristic. So in this case. <clears throat> uh, what are the meaning of those values, okay, in terms of this uh, activation map? So, so uh, let's imagine uh, this gradient has started from some particular, some particular node like this or uh, like this, okay, and then uh, yeah, it was starting with uh, by simply setting uh, uh, setting the gradient of a chosen node as positive one, okay. And then, as we saw in this example uh, about whether this pixel should be decreased or increased and how much, with the how much sensitivity, right? So you know the meaning of this, right? And then, what's the meaning of this gradient values after backpropagating through the ReLU layer? So it means that, okay, even though this guy, that particular pixel of maybe negative 2. So this is not a RGB level pixel. So it is just an activation uh, activation map arriving at uh, at this layer. Okay. So in this case, <coughs> for whatever meaning of this uh, uh, this feature or this convolutional filter, filter uh, this pixel value or this activation value should be decreased so that we can increase Whatever chosen node in the in in here, right? So again, at this uh, feature level, or uh, yeah, whether uh, I mean, uh, suppose this uh, activation map is corresponding to like uh, detecting some kind of edges like this, okay? And then at this particular position of our image uh, here, and then this uh, edge should disappear. Right, because the pattern of uh, the um, strength of that pattern should be decreased so that we can kind of increase the given uh, gradient value, right? And then what about this positive value of our gradient? So it will correspond to this region in our original image, and in that case, okay, this pattern, I mean, the strength of this pattern should increase so that we can, yeah, yeah, we can satisfy the given gradient of positive one at a particular chosen node. Does it make sense? Right? So in some region, for this pattern, should decrease, and some region, uh, it should increase, right? And then this both, like a decreasing or uh, increasing patterns are mixed together in a single image, that may uh, result in a little bit messy or kind of un unintuitive or like a little complicated or noisy kind of a pattern at the end, right? So in this case, <clears throat> when doing this back propagation, we actually uh, also kill the negative gradient itself. 
so like this guy so we don't allow like to decrease uh, some kind of pattern at a particular uh, position so in this case we just uh, set it as zero and set it as zero and set it as zero okay so as a result this gradient will only have those regions that should have a kind of a, uh, increased pattern of this uh, given pattern right so for example these two regions uh, should have uh, should increase uh, the strength of this uh, given pattern okay so when doing this uh, back propagation we do not allow this uh, negative value uh, that uh, wants to decrease uh, 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 the given pattern okay so this is the main idea of the uh, guided back okay the guided back so this was just a normal backprop, but the guided backprop uh, will just al uh, only allow the positive gradient all the way, I mean, uh, in all of the um, intermediate layers. Okay, so that is the main idea. And uh, why should it be so? I mean, yeah, there is no rigorous region, but in practice, if you just use this uh, positive gradient values and then uh, you will yeah empirically you will get more I mean cleaner kind of output okay. <clears throat> any questions about it okay so in this case when using this uh, guided backprop uh, yeah other than just uh, just the normal backprop, uh, we just uh, used uh, we obtain much cleaner kind of shape of our dog, so that uh, we can make a better sense of what particular uh, region of our image uh, is actually uh, yeah is influencing the most uh, to the target variable or the, the particular given uh, given particular node. Okay, so. <clears throat> We can actually do this kind of uh, back, uh, uh, whether it is a guided backprop or the back propagation, uh, we can actually do this process iteratively. Okay, so in this case of uh, saliency map, let's see. So you will just do the um, backprop just once. Okay, just once. And then <clears throat> These are the gradient values, right? These are the gradient values, and their visualization is shown as follows, right? But this is just a gradient visualization, right? But it's not, yeah, we haven't actually updated our image, right? So in this case, um, <clears throat> suppose this pixel value was uh, 105 in terms of this uh, RGB value, and then uh, it had a negative 2, and then uh, we can simply perform the gradient descent, like 0.1 and negative 2, okay? So 105.2, okay? So we will get the entirely updated image after doing this uh, one step of gradient descent that replaces or updates all, every pixel value in our image, right? And then uh, we can re-evaluate or we can do the forward propagation all the way until we reach a particular node of our interest, whether it is a this node or this node. And then I uh, do the back propagation again. And then I uh, evaluate or compute the back propagation or the yeah, partial gradient with respect to every pixel that we have. And then uh, we can obtain, yeah, we can obtain that image. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> in this case, uh, if if you uh, think of this process a little bit carefully, and then we update this image, and then do the uh, forward propagation, and then for the same node, same target node, and then we simply set the gradient of it as one. And do the same thing, right? So what will be what will be the um, objective function? 
that will that will generate this kind of gradient. So yeah, it is a little bit kind of interesting and also I think uh, quite insightful uh, insightful kind of way of thinking. So in this case, we didn't start with uh, any objective function in the beginning, right? We just uh, simply set the gradient of a particular node as simply, yeah, as just a plus uh, positive one, okay? And then what will be the corresponding objective function that will that will produce that will always produce the gradient as positive one? So suppose this node, uh, yeah. So suppose uh, this node as y, for example. Okay, and then what will be the function of y? that will produce the gradient at this particular node as 1. So again, so we consider this partial gradient, right? Because we are considering the gradient at this particular node, and so we have to uh, do the partial derivative with respect to this y. Okay, so this guy should be what? 1, right? And then let's do the um, integral of it. And then what should be f y? Should be y, right? So, <clears throat> in this case, we can we can think of as a original objective function, where we just uh, set the the gradient simply as one all the time. Okay, in that case, the objective function will be this guy, and I mean, yeah, you can just. Yeah, you can uh, think of like a gradient ascent or like using the positive sign over here. I mean, it's just a, a matter of uh, flipping the sign, but uh, it will be just an, uh, like max of fy or uh, just max y. Okay, so in this case, uh, when given this objective function, then the gradient will be always set as 1 and then do the back propagation and using that uh, partial gradient uh, we will update this image. And so here, what is our variable uh, to participate in this optimization problem? Okay. So the um, uh, variable that we can carefully choose or optimize uh, to maximize this given objective function is all the pixels that we have, not the parameter existing in our network, right? So mathematically, it can be represented as this: our image, uh, which uh, yeah, which has all the different pixel values. So this is not just a single uh, scalar; it's uh, actually a set of uh, pixel values that we can freely and independently optimize, right? And this is an, our objective function. And also, in this case, uh, this y can also be represented as like f of i, because yeah, uh, for this uh, output node or yeah, this output node, yeah, it will be anyways a function of uh, our input image, right? So it's just a, a mathematical kind of notation or ex expression. But in, yeah, I think uh, yeah. It will be important uh, for you to have uh, the um, intuitive idea or understanding about what will be the objective function corresponding to the case of setting the gradient as always one, and then what will be our uh, yeah variables to optimize. Okay, so that is uh, shown here. Okay. Argmax with respect to the um, input image, and then this F5 is a particular uh, neuron uh, that we chose. And uh, yeah, let's discuss about this uh, R of an I, which is a regular uh, yeah, regularizer. Okay, so <clears throat> so this is a uh, one example where uh, we set this F of an I. As one of the um, yeah one of the um, alpha node over here, so if it is a cat, and then we want to, yeah we want to 
update this image as uh, yeah such that uh, is uh, yeah its output at this node uh, is maximized okay so it is a score of this particular class that we chose and then our input parameter is I okay okay and then uh, what is this guy so this is our regularizer so so far this part we understood that right and then what is this part so in this case because we have a negative sign here so we want to minimize this part right we want to minimize it. and why do we want to minimize it yeah it is um, yeah it is due to yeah mainly due to like a, the nature or characteristic of a guided backprop so the guided backprop as you as i mentioned all the gradient should be positive right yeah although they can be killed by the relu uh, during the forward propagation of having the negative input to the relu right they will be killed but anyways yeah we will not see any negative value in every each of our layer all the way through the input layer okay so this gradient value should be positive value at this input image right so in that case what's the resulting image so overall any pixel will remain I mean remain the same or it will be increased by some amount because we only allow the positive gradient right so if you imagine like uh, iteratively doing this a uh, gradient descent I mean, so in this particular case we'll be performing gradient uh, ascent but anyways uh, if we keep up uh, iterate uh, keep updating our images through this process and then the overall images will get more and I mean brighter and brighter because we didn't allow any negative gradient right so we want to have this kind of regularizer so that if the total image brightness or the total square sum of this pixel value uh, I mean uh, we want to penalize that okay so that way we can kind of suppress this unlimited uh, increase of uh, every pixels that we have Okay, and then um, <clears throat> in this particular slide, <coughs> it started from this uh, zero image, right? This zero image. So it is up to our, yeah, it is up to actually, uh, it is up to us whether uh, we start with the zero image or a particular existing image that we have. So in this case, so we can do the same uh, optimization process or uh, this kind of uh, image updating process through our gradient ascent yeah starting from this particular image okay really I mean uh, real existing image or we can just uh, start with a uh, some zero image or maybe it can be yeah initialized randomly okay from some Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution ranging from 0 to 255 okay so it's just a matter of it's just a matter of initialization so we can just start with the existing image and then we will yeah that will be our starting point point in our optimization process right and then uh, we can just start with the random initialization right so it's just a matter of this uh, initialization so <clears throat> if you imagine this uh, pre training pre-trained pre network for example in this Okay, so in this case of an image, yeah, image captioning process, and then um, yeah, we have the um, yeah, we just bring or import this uh, pre-trained network, and also yeah, we don't actually update this part, or we can just uh, fine-tune that part, but in this case, yeah, we just uh, started with the yeah previously existing network architecture and also its uh, own parameter set, right? So in that case. We are starting from some meaningful or already kind of, yeah already trained uh, parameter values, and that will be our starting point. But also alternatively, uh, we can start all the way from the scratch, from scratch, so that uh, we just have a random initialization and then just uh, train them from our uh, image captioning model. Okay. So.
in practice, uh, depending on whether uh, we start with the random initialization or real existing image, and uh, in the case of random initialization or zero initialization, and then uh, we will end up with the uh, yeah some of the um, uh, yeah some some on, yeah strange image like this. Okay, but uh, you can view it as like the optimal image uh, that yeah maximizes this given criteria. So in this case, the chosen target node is this. Uh, one of the um, thousand classes uh, corresponding to this uh, dumbbell and uh, cop and Dalmatian and things like that. Any questions so far? Okay, and then uh, during this process, uh, we will do a little bit uh, additional kind of heuristics that we impose in the middle of this optimization process, such as the um, Gaussian blurring, and also, yeah, yeah, clip the pixels with the small values to zero and so on. So in this case, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just gonna skip this part because it's uh, just a heuristic that will that can improve uh, the quality of this uh, resulting image a little bit better. Okay, and then uh, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, uh, other than just a, a target node. I mean, the target node at the last layer corresponding to a particular class, uh, we can just uh, pick up any node in the hidden layer. So, yeah, we can choose uh, any layers. And then, as you can see, you can, if you start from the later layers, and then the pattern might look much more uh, complicated. And then, uh, if it is a, like a lower layer, and then the pattern seems to be much uh, simpler compared to the previous case. Okay, let's see. Okay, so uh, we will not cover this uh, adversary example generation, but uh, there is a dedicated lecture uh, given by uh, the original inventor of this technique, and also Gen, uh, whose name is uh, uh, Ian Goodfellow. So here, let's see. So here, the main idea is as follows: Why is it called uh, adversarial examples? Okay, so. Suppose you are given this image, and then this image is currently correctly classified as an African uh, elephant. Okay, and then this image look looks almost identical to the original image, but suddenly uh, our classifier or our CNN model will classify this as maybe 99% as koala. Okay, so this is the the overall kind of story. <laughs> And uh, how do we achieve uh, this task or this goal? Okay, so let me just get back to this case. Okay, so this image is currently correctly classified as an elephant with maybe 88% of the probability. Okay, so this is the current setting. And then now, we intentionally want to make or change this image so that it can classify it as uh, the um, koala. So in that case, uh, suppose the koala dimension is over here, and then it is currently having the, the probability as maybe only like 10%. So 
So that is the current setting. And then now, uh, whether setting the gradient over here, but uh, the logit value before just the softmax. Uh, okay. So increasing this guy will also kind of roughly the same as increasing this logit value, right? But sim yeah, let's just uh, simply just uh, choose this logit node corresponding to this koala. Okay, so let's just uh, simply set the gradient as one. Okay, based on our intent that the koala score is increased. Okay, and then uh, we can imagine the same thing, and then uh, we do the back propagation, and then suppose this image is having the gradient of positive three and this image has a gradient of negative 3 and this uh, this pixel has a positive 5 and a negative 1 and so on okay so at every pixel we will have a certain gradient value okay so in this case <coughs> if we were to grade, uh, apply the gradient descent just uh, in a uh, standard way standard manner and then uh, suppose this pixel value was uh, yeah 105 and then plus 0.1 and uh, maybe uh, three, so this will be typical gradient descent, right? But suppose some pixel value has maybe the gradient of maybe a hundred. I mean, this is a hypothetical scenario, but suppose the gradient is uh, really big, uh, like a hundred, and then uh, what would be the corresponding update of this pixel value? So uh, let's say this pixel value was maybe 88, and then 0.8 times 100 will result in 98 okay so at the end as a result this pixel uh, was changed from 88 to 98 so can we know yeah can we recognize it or notice it or not I mean if this pixel value has a higher grade uh, a very large value of our gradient and then uh, we updated it by just using the simple gradient descent and then <coughs> yeah the, the difference or the, the amount of changes will be in proportional to the, the amount of the um, gradient, right? And then suppose these regions were uh, usually, uh, mostly having the large gradient values, okay? And then uh, after doing the gradient of update, and then uh, this part uh, have, became, yeah, have become maybe red color. So in this case, we will easily recognize it or not, yeah, notice that, notice the difference, right? But here, adversary example case, the scenario, I mean, our intent is that we just uh, deliberately or we, we just uh, change this image with the minimum amount of difference. Okay, so the minimum amount of the difference so that we actually don't know, yeah, we don't know it, yeah, until we carefully kind of examine it. Okay, so in this case, we can actually clip this gradient value. So if it had a gradient of 100, and then, yeah, we can, yeah, I mean, as a human, yeah, uh, as a human, uh, uh, when just uh, uh, looking at a particular image uh, using our eye, okay, so in this image, we can, uh, we can think of a uh, resolution of our, our eye, which means that, which means the, yeah, so have you heard about, like, this kind of uh, notion of just noticeable difference? Noticeable difference. Okay, so the, the notion, yeah, the meaning of it is like this. So I'm going to give you one particular color having the pixel, uh, pixel value of 120, 120, for example. And then I'm going to give you another pixel or, or another patch or another paper that having uh, 128. Okay, I just give you these two uh, different colors of a papers and then I ask a person uh, whether those two look different or not. And then in the case of humans, uh, human eyes may not be that much sensitive, and so they may not recognize the difference between them, right? And then we add one more pixel value, I mean we add a one more pixel value difference, and more, and more, and so on. And then people will start to notice or recognize that difference through our human eye, right? So that minimum value is called just noticeable difference, okay? 
Okay, and then uh, this just noticeable difference uh, has a kind of interesting characteristic and also a little bit of a kind of nonlinearity. Like uh, if it is a uh, gray, and then uh, people, yeah, uh, I mean, human eyes are more sensitive to maybe some gray color uh, rather than really white color. So in the case of uh, pure white color, and then the noticeable difference uh, may be uh, a little bit larger. So in this case, uh, we cannot increase, so we may, yeah, we may be able to decrease this part. And then uh, until we de it, uh, it is decreased into 245, and then people won't be able to notify that. I mean, people won't be able to notice that, right? And also, in if it is a, a like a gray color, and then uh, yeah, we can maybe easily notice yeah notice that with these much smaller differences. So that way, this uh, just noticeable difference uh, is not a constant. Okay, so it is also dependent on the um, original color and uh, many other kind of yeah circ many other uh, circumstances. But anyways, let's just simplify and then the just noticeable difference for every pixel, regardless of if its original value, is maybe three. Okay, just three. Okay, and then in this case, yeah, we are allowed to change this pixel value uh, ranging between 102 and 108, right? I mean, because, uh, yeah, uh, that is a uh, uh, the range within just notice of a difference com uh, compared to the original value. Okay, so in this case, even though the gradient value is positive three, which has the positive sign and also the magnitude of three, but we at least know that this pixel value should increase so that we can increase this koala score, right? And then we can just uh, simply set this pixel value as 108 okay so that way we just throw away the magnitude information and then we just take the sign of it okay and we just uh, take the maximum possible value that we are allowed which can be viewed at, which can be understood as just noticeable difference okay so once changing it that way and then through just the uh, one time of this uh, gradient descent method then or gradient ascent method uh, that changes this uh, input image and then we will get yeah this kind of image so here you can uh, understand this image as having like for every pixel it just uh, yeah it was changed with the maximum uh, allowed amount uh, we, in terms of this uh, just notice of a difference but uh, whether it uh, increased or decreased so that is determined by by the, the gradient descent, uh, so the the, the back propagate uh, the gradient value with respect to each of these pixels through our back propagation. So <coughs> this way of generating this adversarial examples, okay, is called. I forgot actually the name, but F G something. And uh, S M F G S M. Okay, I think yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is called a fast gradient sign method. Okay. So we only just uh, take the sign and also we just uh, accelerate it, uh, this uh, image updating process through this uh, fast, uh, fast gradient, meaning that we just uh, uh, used maximum possible magnitude of our gradient, but we only uh, obey the sign of this uh, uh, computed gradient. So Yeah, and also, yeah, this uh, uh, FGSM or uh, why this, yeah, why our model? I mean, this can be viewed as kind of, yes, vulnerability of our model, and uh, it can be actually uh, used maliciously by the um, attacker of our uh, deep learning based model. So, suppose we just uh, drive our car uh, using this uh, yeah, self driving kind of technique. So, yeah, given the um, vision input. Yeah, it will just uh, determine in real time whether it keeps going or uh, turn left or right or stops. Okay, so in that case, suppose some 
and some hacker just uh, penetrated into our uh, car system and then replaced the, this image just deliberately into this and then uh, we won't know that okay so uh, something I mean we won't notice that yeah something is uh, happening over here but um, in this case with this a uh, minimum amount of the, the changes uh, it can completely mess up our system right so even even when a person standing there and then uh, we can just uh, keep going uh, hitting hitting that person hard okay so so that is about like uh, security and the vulnerability like issue or hacking the neural net systems and uh, then how can we defend against such kind of attacks right so that is also quite active research area any questions so far Okay, so have you understood uh, how this uh, deep dream works? Deep dream works. So in the case of this deep dream, So it uh, generally follows this framework that uh, we discussed today. So here, okay, so let me describe uh, the main idea briefly. Okay, so we also start with uh, some particular chosen, chosen layer. So not just a particular node, but in this uh, deep dream case, uh, let's just think of choosing one particular layer. And uh, suppose we chose this layer, okay? And then uh, through this uh, forward propagation, uh, we will have the um, activation map. And also, yeah, by the way, uh, in this uh, uh, image understanding stuffs, uh, typically this network uh, is brought, I mean, uh, we just bring this network as a pre trained network. I mean, previously trained uh, using maybe uh, ImageNet or any other kind of, yeah, large scale data sets. So we assume that we start with already pre trained network. Okay. So in this case, uh, updating these parameters in our neural net is not our concern. So we, we are mainly interested in updating the images, right? The pixel values. Okay. So once choosing this layer, and then we will have the first activation map and the second activation map and the third activation map and so on. And then uh, you know the, the meaning of the first channel having like a, this kind of edge and the second channel uh, having maybe this kind of edge, right? Okay, and then uh, let's bring this activation map as follows. So one, two, and then maybe zero and maybe three. And then uh, it, uh, of course, indicates the strength of this given pattern of this edge, for example, right? And then from here, we also arbitrarily set, or we just heuristically set the gradient corresponding to those activation values, okay? And how? We just simply set this activation value itself as our gradient, okay? So it means that in the case of an uh, activation value of 2, and then uh, we set the gradient as positive 2. And then, in the case of 3, we set the gradient as positive 3. Or, uh, if we consider the activation map just before the ReLU, and then uh, it can also involve those uh, negative values as well, right? And so suppose this uh, value was maybe negative 4. And then in this case, the gradient will be set as negative 4. Right. <coughs> okay. So in this case, we can do the unpack propagation by uh, by starting. I mean, starting from this kind of gradient values, right? And then what's the intent of it? So the intent is, for this node, we want to have the um, 
increase the value of it with the amount of, I mean, in proportional to uh, the value of 2. And then in this case, we want to increase it as well, but uh, we want this value to be increased much more compared to this value. Because we over here, uh, we set the gradient as 2, but uh, in the lower, in this pixel, we set the gradient as positive 3. Right? And it means that we want this value more act, uh, to increase more actively or uh, with a lar more, uh, larger amount. So that is the intent. Right? Okay, then using this gradient with uh, this intent in mind, we do the back propagation and change the original image, I mean, update this image. And then we the forward, uh, do the forward pass or the forward propagation, and then uh, we will uh, have the new, yeah, uh, new activation value, right? And then uh, probably uh, this image, I mean, this one will got, yeah, uh, will have, uh, will have uh, updated as a. 1 point maybe 2 and 2.4 and the negative 4.8 and 3.6 it will not be like exact number right so that is the gradient and then uh, we don't guarantee that yeah we are not guaranteed to have this uh, same kind of I mean same amount or the same ratio of this uh, increasing or decreasing rate so in practice, I mean, so my point is, if we just uh, updated this uh, two directly using the gradient, and then uh, we may we, yeah we may get like point uh, two as our step size for example, and then uh, yeah we can have no problem no problem of updating this two as two point five using the gradient uh, set, but these activation values are not our variables that we can directly update right so the updating is only done over here and then yeah hoping that this gradient uh, can be increased by this amount or this amount or at least in proportional to this amount right and so in practice it's like 1.1 and 2.5 and 7.3.55 and uh, negative 4.7 for example right through our direct update of our image right okay so that was the first step or the one step of a gradient descent I mean gradient ascent in the deep dream and then given this uh, newly updated activation map we just set also the the gradient the same as the original activation value so here if it is a 1.1 and then the gradient will be set as 1.1 and 2.5 and then the gradient will be set as and things like that okay <coughs> so in this case let's imagine or think about the behavior of the, this uh, this updating scheme or strategy okay so in this case yeah, let's make it a little bit more extreme. So negative one and a hundred or maybe five thousand and uh, negative three, for example. So in this case, this will get really, really large gradient, right? In proportion to the original activation value. And this guy, uh, which has a relatively small magnitude, and then uh, it will get a low gradient value. Okay, so in this case, it will almost explode, right? And so this uh, 5,000, after doing uh, several steps of a gradient ascent, and then uh, it, it may become maybe uh, 20,000, okay? And then in this case, maybe negative two, and most, and this, this guy is maybe 300, for example, okay? So it's like, uh, yeah, we can view this process as like uh, exaggerating, exaggerating, the initially shown or yeah initially appearing activation value which indicates the strength of this pattern right so what was the meaning of this original activation value so that was corresponding to the strength of this particular pattern in this particular position and another position and so on 
right? So that way, so starting from this image, okay? Yeah, corresponding to this region, maybe over here, right? So over here, some uh, some important some important pattern uh, that will form uh, the dog, for example. Okay, for example, dog's nose. So dog nose uh, channel or activation map was like this, and then uh, at this particular point we had a relatively large activation value, right? And then through our uh, gradient ascent uh, done in this uh, deep dream, and then this part uh, will be, yeah, will be deformed or converted uh, in a way that the activation map corresponding to this part for this uh, dog's nose uh, will be more and more exaggerated. Because yeah, if it had maybe 10 magnet, I mean 10, as our uh, activation value, and then uh, in proportion to this, and then uh, it will be increased much more compared to the other region that didn't have any uh, dog nose pattern uh, corresponding to the activation value of maybe point uh, uh, one, for example, and then uh, it will not increase that much compared to this value. So that way we will just uh, we will exaggerate. Uh, this a small kind of pattern more and more. So that's the main idea of this deep dream. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> 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 So this is the result of the um, deep dream, okay? And probably this, uh, uh, I mean, here uh, our input should, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we initially have to specify a particular layer. And uh, in this uh, case, uh, we probably set the particular layer as uh, a little bit uh, later layers, really close to the um, output, output node, okay? So in this case, yeah. Why is it called a uh, deep dream? So, in this image, we don't see any kind of patterns, right? But from the neural nest perspective, okay? So the neural nest perspective, somewhere around here, corresponding to this part, so neural net has actually seen some of the um, small patterns of the um, dog, okay? So although we do not easily relate this part as like a dog image, but from the neural net perspective, neural net uh, found that some of the, some of the relevant patterns with the moderate amount of the um, activation, okay, uh, corresponding to the um, dog like a shape. So in that case, uh, if we exaggerate what this uh, neural net has in mind or what this uh, neural net sees in terms of uh, the, the pattern that they they see uh, on their own, okay. In that case, uh, if we exaggerate it, and then uh, we can see that neural net uh, kind of sees uh, those kind of patterns with a kind of a small, although it is a small amount, but when exaggerating it, when exaggerating it, and then yeah, uh, it can be shown in this, in this, so that we can also see and understand what the deep learning or neural net sees in a different parts of our image. So that's the meaning of this this technique. Any other questions? So, <clears throat> so these images and also uh, this image has the difference, right? 
So what made the difference between these uh, different examples? It is because we chose different layers in our neuron. Okay, so this. Yeah, suppose we chose we chose this layer to run our uh, deep dream, and then it will try to exaggerate the patterns captured in this particular layer. But also, we can choose this layer to run our deep dream separately, right? And then, because this layer is a kind of a ladder layers compared to this guy, right? And then, this layer. Uh, will try, yeah, will play a role of capturing more complex patterns, right? So in that case, if we start from our, uh, uh, if we start our uh, deep dream starting from this layer, and then uh, it will, yeah, it will exaggerate relatively low level patterns like this. And also, if we start from the much later layers, uh, which will mainly capture a little bit complicated patterns. And then it will just uh, show this much more, kind of, yeah, more meaningful kind of a, or complete kind of shape of an object. And also, and let me also discuss in in this particular example, and also in the salience map cases. Um, <clears throat> once we set this uh, target layer, once we set the target layer, and then. The forward and the back prop, yeah, only need to be done within this range, right? We don't actually need to forward prop on this part because the gradient will be set in this in this layer that we chose, right? So the forward and the backward, yeah, that will be done within that particular, yeah, for, between the input image and also the the chosen out the chosen target layer. Yeah, and also uh, when uh, explaining this a uh, deep dream, uh, I just yeah I just uh, discussed about a particular I mean uh, one single channel, but typically when running the deep dream, uh, we just uh, do this uh, kind of deep dream kind of a, a way of uh, setting the gradient across all the channels within a particular layer, right? So in that case, if this edge was capturing this and this edge was capturing like this. And then uh, we we just exaggerate all together. Any other questions? So these are the deep dream pseudocode, and so the most important part. Is this guy? So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, if you just uh, look at the deep learning library code, or yeah, I mean, yeah. If you uh, did your homework uh, using the NumPy to implement uh, all the different layers, and then uh, you will, yeah, just uh, mainly implement the forward propagation and also the back back propagation, right? For a particular layer, right? So that was it. So do these two modules, right? And so. So this is the forward propagation, I mean the activation value. Okay, so these are this is the variable to store the so forward propagation value. And this is the the back uh, the, the, the variable to store the partial gradient with respect to those variables included in that particular layer. Okay. So you can view this as a entire activation map within a particular layer, and this is the partial gradient corresponding to each uh, each pixel or each element in our entire gra uh, entire activation map, right? And then uh, we just uh, yeah it can be maybe uh, sixty four by sixty four uh, by maybe two fifty five two fifty six. So this is just typical activation map. And then this is a forward propagation activation map. And then uh, typically when computing this uh, partial gradient with respect to this activation map. And then uh, we will do their own kind of computation of this uh, back propagation, right? But in this case, we just uh, simply assign this uh, back propagation, I mean the partial gradient corresponding to this activation map as the forward propagation value itself. Okay, so this is the, the most important main code.
and for the other part, it is a little, yeah, yeah, some some additional heuristics to make this uh, deep dream uh, work better in in practice. So like uh, some jittering and uh, some gradient normalization. So it's like this. So, so this kind of uh, jittering is like so. We start from a single image like this, right? But uh, just to randomize this process, we just like move this entire image by one pixel to the right, right? Although we have a blank, like a blank column due to this uh, shifting, but yeah, uh, that image can be viewed as like a slight difference. I mean, slightly different version of this original image, right? So during this uh, uh, gradient ascent uh, iterative processes, and then uh, we keep kind of randomly jittering or shifting this image. And also another uh, heuristic that we use, uh, it's not so much about the heuristic, but uh, it's actually a uh, quite useful technique. But okay, so this is called the uh, L1 uh, normalization of our gradient. So in this case, <coughs> So starting from the deep dream or the starting from setting the gradient the same as yeah the same as activation value and then we will do the um, typical backprop and then uh, yeah all the way on all the way to the um, input pixels right and then suppose this pixel had the gradient of positive 3 and this pixel had the uh, gradient of negative 3 and so on right and then uh, suppose we have like a the image size is a 2 by 2 and then the gradient was uh, 3 and negative 1 and uh, 5 and maybe 4 okay and then uh, we can view this as like a, a gradient vector like 3 negative 1 and the 5 4 right and so we basically uh, increase or the decrease this uh, gradient globally so that the entire gradient I mean the gradient vector norm or the the length of this gradient vector uh, to be always the same. So in this case, it's like uh, three squared uh, negative. Uh, so it is a L1 norm based regularization. So three and uh, one, five and four, and then we divide this each of these values by this amount. Okay. So in this case, yeah, we can kind of yeah regularize regularize this uh, gradient ascent or gradient update at every yeah every iteration. So sometimes at a particular iteration. We may get uh, yeah relatively like relatively large gradient values overall. So in this case, we may get we may change the entire image uh, very much, right? So image may get distorted a lot, right? In that particular iteration, I mean, if our gradient uh, is computed as really large values overall, I mean, for each of these values, right? But sometimes uh, if these gradients are too small, and then uh, using the one step of this gradient up, uh, update and then the image will not get changed much right so in this case if we normalize this gradient with respect to it's the l1 norm then we can kind of uh, yeah yeah we can kind of guarantee the 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 same amount of same amount of the um, uh, changes uh, in our image overall right so that is the L1 norm based gradient normalization. I mean, why do we need it? I mean, if if we add it and then uh, it works, it works better in practice. So that's the simple reason. So there is no rigorous like uh, logical reason that we should need it, but yeah, in practice, it gives a better result. Okay, so that is the gradient normalization part. And also, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this uh, gradient normalization is a quite useful, yeah, useful technique. Yeah, let me, yeah, uh, yeah, let me just uh, spend uh, maybe two more minutes to just uh, finish this explanation. So there is a something called a gradient penalty. So there is a kind of regularization technique uh, called the um, gradient penalty or GP, or uh, it is also used in uh, GANs. Uh, training the uh, generative adversary network that we will study probably in the next lecture. And so in that case, 
<coughs> yeah, suppose our uh, gradient vector is like uh, this kind of four dimensional vector. Okay, so um, yeah, we have our original loss function that should minimize, and also we want to have this uh, gradient value, gradient vector to, to always have the norm of one. I mean, L1, uh, unit L1 norm. Okay, so in that case, uh, we can uh, do this kind of heuristic that we just applied in the deep dream. So there is a kind of heuristic method, but uh, that is not theoretically justified. But oh, yeah, but instead, uh, kind of more theoretically justified or cleaner, kind of cleaner strategy or technique is to actually add this as additional regularization term. So that, so this is our gradient vector uh, called, for example, G, and then, yeah, uh, G one norm minus 1 and for example like squared and then some parameter alpha okay and then uh, uh, what's the role of it so it plays a role of like okay if the gradient at the particular iteration the L1 norm based gradient was too large okay so in that case uh, the norm was 10 for example and then uh, it will incur or it will just create this uh, 9 squared as our yeah, as our additional loss term or loss value, right? So we don't want that situation. So in this case, the gradient, I mean, uh, it also has its own kind of uh, gradient or derivative, right? So yeah, it will be, yeah, it is also differentiable function, right? Like this kind of thing, right? And also maybe something like that, right? So that way, <coughs> yeah. The gradient uh, value itself can be also part of our loss function, okay, objective function, that will also give us some gradient. So that, it, that sounds a little bit ambiguous or, yeah, but, yeah, I mean, if you just uh, come up with your own example like this, and then uh, you will get the idea. But, yeah, in general, uh, if we add uh, this kind of loss, uh, loss term, and then uh, it plays a role of, like, uh, penalizing, or the yeah, fitting the, the overall gradient length or the, the gradient vector uh, norm uh, to be close to one. I mean, softly, right? I mean, in this case, we don't just uh, directly or explicit normalize our gradient as an additional post-processing step that we used in the deep dream. So we don't follow that approach because that is not theoretically justified. I mean, that post-processing, I mean, where is that coming from? In our gradient descent, it doesn't involve, it doesn't include such kind of step, right? So adding that as an additional uh, step uh, is just a heuristic that kind of hurts the, the theoretical soundness of this uh, gradient-based optimization. But in this case, yeah, uh, we added that as a, officially as an our objective function, right? So in that case, it plays almost the same role. Okay, so I think the time's up. So yeah, uh, let's continue this uh, Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Gradient, 
어떤 뭐 32개 배치가 있다. 그냥 그 32개 한 번, 그리고 두 번째 이터레이션에서는 또 32개 두 번째 배치 갖고 또 하잖아요. 그럼 각각의 배치에 대해서 이제 우리가 한 번에 그 그레이디언 디스, 어, 디센트 업데이트를 해줄 텐데, 우리가 이제, 네. 그 적용하게 되는 그레이디언트들이 어떤 이터레이션에서는 혹은 어떤 배치에서는 전체적으로 값이 굉장히 크게 나온 거예요. 그러면 이제 그 배치에 대해서는 우리가 파라메터를 왕창 업데이트 해주는 케이스들이 혹은 이게 파라메터일 수도 있고 아니면 이뭐 딥드림 같은 케이스에서는 이제 그 이미지 상에 존재하는 각각의 픽셀이 되고요. 그러니까 어찌됐건 우리의 이제 그 최적화에 참여하는 그 변수들을 얼마만큼의 양으로 우리가 업데이트를 해주느냐 이게 그러니까 전체적인 그 양의 어떤 네, 전체적인 그 양은 뭔가 이제 그, 네, 그 L1이나 L2 노음 같은 걸로 잴 수가 있는 거죠. 그러니까 얘는 그레이디언트가 1, 쟤는 그레이디언트가 2, 쟤는 그레이디언트가 3이다. 그러면 1제곱, 2제곱, 3제곱을 혹은 1, 2, 3을 다 더하면 총 6이라는 게 토탈 변화되는 양이고 어떤 경우는 뭐 10, 뭐 마이너스 5, 9, 이러면 뭐 절대 값으로 따지면 10, 5, 9를 다 더하면 24만큼의 업데이트가 되는 거잖아요. 그러니까 훨씬 더 많이 업데이트가 되는 거잖아요. 그때는. 근데 이제 이게 어떤 배치에서는 혹은 그매 이터레이션당 각, 각 이터레이션당 그 너무 변화가 적거나 너무 변화가 큰게안 좋다 이거예요. 배, 배치 어떤 배치에 대해서 뭔가 치중되거나 하는 거를 좀 그렇죠. 뭐 그런 셈이에요. 네. 그런 셈. 그리고 여기 딥드림에서는 뭐 배치라는 개념이 나오진 않지만 여기서도 하여튼 매 이터레이션마다 그 내가 그게 좀 변화하는 거를 내가 좀 제한을 두겠다. 그러니까 이게 그 딥드림을 한번 했을 때 뭔가 이미지를 완전히 왕창 바꿔버리면 이거는 또 오리지널 이미지랑 또 너무 달라져갖고 이게 좀 별로 영좀 이게 현실적으로 원래 이미지랑 비슷해 보이지가 않는 거죠. 그렇다고 또 거꾸로 이게 또 너무 조금 바뀔 때그 조금 바뀌는 걸 그대로 두면 이 이미지를 아무리 뭐뭐 이제 뭐 딥드림을 뭐 천번 만번 이터레이션 돌려도 이미지가 그냥 그대로인 것 같아 보이는 거예요. 네, 뭐 물론 이거는 천번 동안 다 그레이디언트가 작아야 된다라는 전제가 있긴 하지만 네, 뭐 하여튼 그런 식으로 지금 뭐 그레이디언트가 너무 작거나 너무 많음으로써 생길 수 있는 그런 부작용 같은 것들을 좀 네. 음, 오늘 그 세그멘테이션 잠깐 네. 나왔습니다. 우리가 세그멘테이션을 네. 할때 네. 혹시 기존의 그 딥러닝이 아닌 네. 영상 처리에서 쓰이는 네. 그 기술들을 이용해서 전 처리를 하면 은 네. 혹시 훨씬 더 성능이라든지 아니면 속도에서 개선될 네. 수 있는 건가요? 보통 그 논문 같은 거 보면 은 뭔가 그런 처리 없이 그냥 바로 모델에 네. 넣어서 그러니까 그게 뭐 딥러닝에서 이게 엔드 텐드로 뭔가 이렇게 외부에 외부에 이제 그 휴리스틱한 알고리즘 같은 거를 쓰는 게 오히려 딥러닝한테는 좀 해가 된다. 딥러닝을 도와주기는 커녕 좀 뭔가 이미 다 얘가 정보를 지멋대로 처리를 다 해버려서 그 정보를 받아다가 딥러닝이 할수 있는 것들이 좀뭐 걔한테서 도움을 받아서 딥러닝이 좀 뭔가 안 해줘도 되는 그래서 좀 편해진 부분도 있지만. 얘가 이미 다 뭔가 망쳐버린 거는 내가 어떻게 아, 이미 뭔가 복, 복원을 할 수가 없는 거죠 일반적으로 그러니까 뭐 그런 이제 엔드 트렌드 어, 패러다임 때문에 이제 그런 것들이 이제 배제가 된게 일반적이긴 하고요 근데 이제 뭐 지금 얘기했던 것처럼 그런 이제 어, 뭐 레이블이 없, 없는 아니면은 그 기존 어떤 컴퓨터 비전 테스크에서 쓰던 그런 방법들을 또 딥러닝 쪽과 이렇게 좀 엮어보려는 시도는 또 많이 있어요 그러니까 그게 예를 들면 뭐 우리가 세그멘테이션을 하는데 세그멘테이션 하는데 그냥 이미지가 그냥 이게 강아지다라는 정보가 있는 거예요. 강아지가 어디 있는지에 대한 세그멘테이션 레이블까지는 없어요. 그리고 세그멘테이션 레이블은 되게 비싸고 그러니까 만드는 게 되게 고라프거든요. 네. 뭐 이렇게 다 이렇게 경계를 따야 되는 거잖아요. 네. 네, 그러니까 그게 되게 힘든 작업이라 우리는 뭔가 그냥 이미지만 이, 이게 강아지다, 이건 뭐, 뭐 새다 뭐 이런 정보만을 가지고 그래도 세그멘테이션 세그멘테이션 정보를 얻고 싶은 거예요. 어디에 강아지가 있는지나 이런 정보까지도. 그러니까 그런 경우에, 그러니까 이게 그러면은 뭐그 애초에 그 세그멘테이션, 그러니까 픽셀 레벨에 세그멘테이션 어떤 정보가 없는데 그거를 아예 못 하는 거 아니냐? 그렇진 않아요. 어느 정도 할 수가, 그러니까 좀 불완전하지만 할수 있는 방법이 좀 있거든요. 그리고 그런 방식을 이제 뭐라고 부르냐면 또 위클리, 위클리 슈퍼바이즈드 어쩌고라고 불러요. 뭐 위클리 슈퍼바이즈드 세그멘테이션이다. 그러면 슈퍼비전은 세그멘테이션이라는 테스트를 하고 싶은데 슈퍼비전은 우리가 위크하게 이게 어디에 이제 정확하게 강아지가 어느 이렇게 픽셀에 있는지를 가르쳐주지 않지 이건 그냥 강아지다라고만 주는 거죠. 그러면 이게 하여튼 슈퍼바이 그러니까 강아지다라는 건 알려줬지만 강아지가 정확하게 어디 있는다라고는 알려주지 않았기 때문에 세그멘테이션 테스크를 하기에는 부족한 레이블이죠. 
네, 그래서 그걸 이제 위크 소비전이라고도 하거든요. 그래서 그런 경우에 이제 그러면 어떻게 그러면 좀이 테스크를 좀더 잘할 수 있느냐 그게 아까 이제 그런 언스퍼바이즈드로 이 이미지를 세그멘테이션 하는 기법들이 좀 있어요. 이제 뭐 스펙트럼 노멀라이제이션이 뭐 하여튼 이런저런 테크닉들도 있어요. 네, 그래서 그런 거 가지고 이제 한 거를 이쪽 그 딥러닝 쪽과 이렇게 결합을 해서 뭔가 하는 경우가 좀 있어요. 혹시 이 다음 주에는 수업 안 해요? 다음 주요? 네. 수업해요. 아 수업 하는데 아 프로젝트 발표로 예정이 되어져 있는데 하, 이 진도가 이렇게 생각만큼 좀 빨리 안 나가서. 근데 이렇게 나가면 간 소재랑 그 얘기 할수 있는 건가요? 와. 좀 어떻게 해봐야죠. 뭐. <웃음> 네. 시험은 점검이세요? 네. 감사합니다. 네. 기말, 기말에는 중간 때처럼 시험, 작년 시험 때 붙으면 <웃음> 생각 좀 해볼게요. <웃음> 아니, 그게 또 주면, 아. 안 주는 게 나은 것 같아요. 하긴, 근데, 아, 글쎄요. 주. 근데 안 주면 또 이걸 갖고 있는 사람이 없나? 그때 근데 아예 안 주셨잖아요. 네? 작년에 시험 보고 나서 달라고 하는 거 아예 안 주셨어요. 좀 고민 좀 해볼게요. 아, 그러니까 주면은 이게 또 중간고사도 봤다시피 알다시피 이게 나도 이게 또 똑같이 나이. 비슷하게 내는 게 이게 또 낯으로 쓰로 그렇게 또못 내게 되는 셈이니까 또 아니 나이 안 해요. 나이 더 갑자기 나이 나이 더 올라갔다 이거다는 이제 좀 평균도 뭔가 비슷해. 평균의, 평균의 차이가 얼마? 작년이랑 또 아, 그러니까 다른 시험 문제를 낼 수밖에 없었던 거예요. 좋든 싫든 나도 <웃음> 뭐 하여튼 네. 안안 되는데. <웃음> 그러니까 준, 준, 주든 안 주든 상황이 이렇게 크게 달라질 건 없을 것 같아요. 작년 기말 때 정말 어려웠는데. 어? 작년에 들었었어. 네네네. 그랬구나. 그냥 제가 볼까 네. 작년에 들어서 오늘의 수업이 이해가 된것 같아요. <웃음> 오늘에서야 <웃음> 이해가 완벽하게 됐어. 난 내년에 다시 들어야 돼. <웃음> 진짜 이해가 안 나거든. 아, 그지? 저 네. 저번에 그 여쭤봤던 네. 그 겨울에 그 스터디 관련해서 네, 네. 그 행아웃으로 연주해 네. 주신다 해서 제가 찾아봤는데 네. 제가 착각한 게 그냥 막 이렇게 검색을 해서 들어갈 수 네. 있는 그런 걸로 아, 알았는데 네. 나한테 그, 임, 네. 그 지메일 